what I'm going to show you um, is uh, uh, how we can utilize this type of analysis to actually engage in design-based work. And we at Esri call this type of design-based work geodesign. This is where we leverage data to contextualize design and decision-making. Geodesign is also about evaluating your designs as you're engaged in the development of them and understanding the impacts associated with them. So I'm going to show some of this capability that Ewan just demonstrated within GeoPlanner, but then I'm also going to take it a step further and start to physically interact with some design intervention that we might be recommending on a particular, particular landscape. I'm in an application that we call GeoPlanner. This is a browser-based application. Um, hey, Ryan. Yes. What these guys are trying to do is geodesign the oceans. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically it. They're trying to pick yep. polygons and evaluate the consequences of those polygons with respect to fish, uh, the impact on fish and economics. So uh, we're, I'm just making this bridge so everybody has the same language. A geo designers like uh, Ryan is a landscape geo designer, like for national parks. He designs, adds, you know, does those kind of geo design planning. And you guys are basically creating a geo design for the ocean. So it's exactly the same thing. It's just it's a little different vernacular. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, perfect. And and I'll, I'll do my best to make some of those transitional um, uh, examples throughout this as well. So you can see the parity of how these concepts could be applied to exactly, uh, exactly what you're doing. So we've launched the application. Um, basic UI, including a table of contents that we populate with data that we're going to be utilizing to contextualize our design. This reaches out to Living Atlas content uh, that you may have in your um, individual ArcGIS online organization. So all of that information that Byrne and Sean had shared with you is available uh, to access through this, uh, this application, um, as well as um, a series of uh, modeling capabilities. So the WebGIS is incredibly rich in terms of its analytical capabilities as well. And one of those is um, the weighted raster overlay that uh, you and it just displayed that um, we've essentially recast in this web-based um, application. And I'll show you that in, uh, in just one second. So contextual information, what I'm going to show you here in this, in this demo that will then translate into your work on the oceans is how we can utilize geodesign in this application to understand the impacts of renewable energy scenario planning um, and how we can design different renewable energy scenarios, receive feedback on that information as we're developing them, and then make decisions about which scenario we would like to implement. So for this, I'm just going to move in a little bit closer to California here. And I'm going to show you that we have contextual information that we can reach out to. This is from the National Renewal Renewable Energy Lab. It's a map of biomethane potential. So if I was looking at renewable energy potential um, associated with biomethane, I'd be looking at locating my facilities someplace within these counties that actually have biomethane resources, i.e. agricultural um, uh, operations. Similarly, with biomass potential, and then solar, as well as then um, wind information um, uh, as well. So this information is then contextually available to you as you engage in the design process. Now let's look at that weighted raster overlay uh, model um, that we were just looking at just one moment ago. Here I'm going to come to the modeler. I'm going to go to a solar potential model that I had already started. And I've created a very simple one, right? Solar based on aspect, the land cover conditions, and the slope conditions of a particular location. These are essentially three data layers that I'm assessing in my model. I can expand the individual um, layer itself, and this is very similar to the user parameterization that you and I just illustrated. Whereas here, higher scores relate to um, greater suitability for my solar conditions. So you'll notice here in this aspect model, I'm placing an emphasis on flatland for the construction of solar panels, and then south facing slopes into the north, um, you receive uh, a lower premium for that. Similarly, 
Then with land cover, here we're looking at uh, as strictly avoiding building the solar panels on water, but we're also then emphasizing things like barren land and or agriculture because those are conducive to that type of construction. And then similarly with um, slope, where we're placing a premium on lower sloped areas. I can save my model and then I will ultimately turn it on here and we're going to see um, that, uh, uh, that information then displayed um, uh, in our map. What I'm gonna do here then is I'm gonna zoom in to show you the rapidity uh, and how quickly this, um, this work um, is actually then conducted. You'll notice that as I pan and zoom, the map is redrawing and rescaling the raster cells that are visible here. And this is occurring very, very rapidly. So very similarly, I could say that aspect is more important. So this goes back to one of the questions from just a moment ago. The user could parameterize any of these layers or the scores within them. I've just increased the weight of aspect over slope and I'll click save again. And you're gonna notice that this map is going to very quickly redraw. Um, uh, 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 very, very quickly. So this then provides you with almost instantaneous information uh, about different locations that might be suitable or capable of supporting different landscape functions. So we use this for biodiversity, we use this for siting construction, we use it for identifying areas of solar potential. Translating this to the oceans, these types of suitability surfaces could be conducive to illustrating certain types of habitat or other policies that you're um, trying to find particular locations that would be, um, would be applicable um, for that. So what I'm gonna do next is actually hop into uh, some of the design elements um, of, uh, of this application to show you how we can get real-time feedback about those design interventions. Hey, Ryan, just before you do that, uh, I just wanna point something out. Did you notice that the raster that he's, that he's processing is dynamic? So often we have multi-resolution data side types, some vector in his case, some raster, uh, some elevation modeled in great detail, other times elevation models are not so great detail. What the system basically does is it resamples dynamically and does the modeling computation all on the fly. So that couple of seconds pause uh, that's happening in his uh, reevaluation is, is a total transformation and dynamic integration of the data from multiple sources. And this has some interesting advantages because new data types will be coming along. And you guys will get, you know, I don't know, you already figured it out, I'm sure. So once you've got the suitability map or the interpretive map or model of what you, now you want to do something in the area of design. So this is involving sketching. So go ahead, Ryan. Exactly. So we were working with um, a client recently um, about testing different renewable energy scenarios um, on um, their particular um, farm uh, located in the Central Valley um, of, uh, of California. Uh, that particular location is a place called Red Rock Ranch. I'll make that my active study area and then we can ultimately start to engage in different renewable energy scenarios um, on this particular location. And you'll notice in the top of my table of contents, we have different renewable energy technology. We've created these as individual layers related to anaerobic digesters, gasifiers, solar storage stations, and then wind power. Now, the real power here is that each of these design layers um, has rich attribution um, associated with it. So that as we start to sketch individual design features, um, we have the ability to not only create that wide list of what they are. So this is a list of different uh, uh, different solar panel technology types that could be applied, but then the symbols that are associated with them, but then the rich attribution that ultimately is going to be powering um, some of the evaluation analytics that we're using to compute our design impacts as we're engaged in that design process. So as we build out these individual layers then, uh, we have the ability uh, to physically place those things in space and understand um, different performance metrics 
uh, associated with them. So I'm going to come into just a little bit tighter area here and show you what that starts to look like. I'm going to open up my design palette. I'm going to select my pencil. And you'll notice then in our solar area, these are the same um, uh, solar panel types that we were just looking at in our underlying palette. We can then also look at the different wind turbines that we could physically be placing um, uh, in, um, in space. And then quite simply, um, what we're able to then uh, do here is physically select a solar panel that we're looking at part for our design. I've selected this Aleco brand. And then we can say, let's convert these pecans um, into a large solar array. And I can physically uh, sketch that in this particular location. And so you could imagine that we can do this freehand. You could imagine that we could be uh, uh, selecting individual parcels or different um, uh, ecological units or administrative boundaries and making these, um, making these changes. So you can then imagine that you can start to play with different um, uh, versions of this, uh, of this information. But here's where it really becomes geodesign and really um, uh, critical for understanding what are the impacts associated with this design decision that I've, that I've just made. So for that, we can come to evaluate and I'm going to open a dashboard. And these dashboards then provide us with real-time information about the characteristics of this design area that I, that I have just built. So for example here, we have this particular location, which is 121,000 square feet of solar, translated to acres. That's about a three-acre solar field. And then if we actually look at the estimated generation potential of this, is around 14 million kilowatt hours. But but of course, then we know there are different efficiencies and uh, uh, changes in the specific site locations. So my next KPI then looks at the actual generation potential of this particular solar field. Now, these KPIs are entirely customizable in that you can physically develop the mathematics that is driving the underlying variable that you're trying to measure. So in our particular example here, we're looking at the watt square footage for our solar panels. By the, square foot, by the square footage of the panels themselves, times 1,000 to convert to kilowatt hours, our temporal conversions. We have capacity factors from the National en Renewable Energy Laboratory that we're piping in as constants. And all of that information together then provides um, this particular um, output. We can continue to scroll through some of our other um, uh, metrics here. It would take approximately 11,371 solar panels in order to fill in that footprint at a cost of about um, $2 million for a solar installation um, of, that, uh, uh, of that size. Now, here's where things start to get really interesting is that we can look at um, uh, this, uh, uh, this information here, 11,000 solar panels, but then as we engage in this design process, we can watch these dashboards um, update and change. So let's say um, we're going to put another array um, in this particular location right here. And as we draw that now, you're seeing this real-time feedback associated with your design, uh, your design decision. Now it's 16,000 solar panels um, in order to fill um, those, two, uh, those two elements. So the practical applications of this are really quite interesting then. So you can imagine that we have this farmer. He's interested in becoming energy independent. So we can develop a scenario to determine what that would look like for energy um, uh, independence for, um, for this, particular, um, uh, this particular farmer. Now, what we've ultimately done for that then is created another composite um, KPI, which looks at the net balance of energy consumption versus production for this particular farm. And this particular farm consumes about 96,000 kilowatt hours a year. And in this particular design scenario, we've put a small modest solar installation here. And you'll notice that the farmer is still not quite reaching his target of energy independence. He's still relying on outside sources for about 18,000 um, kilowatt hours a year. 
I can come to another scenario that I've developed. This is one that looks at the same solar installation. We've now added an anaerobic digester, a gasifier, and we've placed some wind in this particular location. And all of these symbols are entirely customizable. I've kept them very cartoonish here just for the demonstration. But these could actually be 3D symbols and, and very sophisticated graphics to, to represent these. But now you'll notice in this particular scenario, the farmer is generating way in excess of what he needs in order to break even on his net balance. So I've created then another one, uh, scenario C, that looks at a modest installation of wind power and that same um, solar installation. And right now they're creating 19 additional kilowatt hours a year than they would use. So essentially met that, uh, that net balance. And just like in these other individual pieces that we were looking at before, for that wind turbine component, um, we can see the area associated with it. We can look at um, uh, the potential, the actual potential when you convert it to real world conditions, and the number of wind turbines that the farmer would be placing within that particular, that particular location. The, the final thing that I'll show you then is the real power here about being able to compare these um, uh, design alternatives um, uh, side by side. And we do that with a KPI report. So here you'll notice we have our three scenarios and we have all of the different indicators um, that we were just looking at in the individual dashboard. And where there are relevant values because wind is inserted in a scenario, you'll notice that there are values populated here. We can scroll all the way over to the right to identify our net balance. And we see that scenario one was 18K in deficit, scenario two was 140 in surplus, and then this one is getting very close to hitting the nail on the head for that net balance. So this becomes then really powerful as you're um, working with stakeholders and or subject matter experts to try to find the best scenario implementation um, for metrics of interest um, to you. So we could very easily translate this type of geodesign thinking to your work within the ocean. And the things that you might be sketching might be policy areas. They might be um, things associated with um, uh, not allowing um, uh, uh, oil and gas exploration and those types of things. And then you could imagine a similar set of KPIs to measure the types of things that you're interested in. Carbon sequestration, catch potential, biodiversity impacts. Those could all be built into this type of report so that you could iteratively, uh, iteratively um, move through, um, uh, move through that work. Okay. The final thing that I'd like to show you here then is that one of the wonderful aspects about geodesign and these applications is that they're also highly collaborative. So we could create a project within this application and we can invite other users to this project and they can then iteratively engage in design simultaneously with us. We're watching their changes in real time. We're using that to reconcile differences between the design. So you could imagine that this could be an incredibly powerful framework for engaging stakeholders, engaging other subject matter experts to communally come together with consensus on scenario and design based um, thinking. And then tell stories about it. I mean, the story map uh, publishing, publishing platform also ties into this. I'd like to review what uh, Ryan talked about. First, he talked about a concept of geodesign, and this so matches what you're doing. The concepts are first you do science, let's call it um, suitability modeling or process modeling, and you guys are already doing that with your raster materials. Those outputs go into a interactive design process, something that Enrique talked about wanting to do with each sp specific country with their different econometric models integrated to it. And then there's evaluation side on the output side. So lots of data coming in. And then this app that uh, Ryan showed, which is a generic, I'll emphasize, it's a generic web app. So it's not the desktop that Ewan showed for the professional, it's a web app that can be accessed anywhere in the world, hitting the cloud to do these geo design things. And then there's evaluation models. So input of science, 
an econometric evaluation of alternatives on the other side, which is exactly what you guys have figured out. So this is yeah. very common within uh, the landscape field. Uh, Ryan's background, he has a PhD in landscape planning uh, and invented a lot of these concepts with his colleagues in our field on the land. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, do you guys Absolute have pleasure. Thank you. Ryan? I'm I just a, just very present. Go ahead. Go ahead, Darcy. Just a quick question. Thank you so much for all of these presentations. Uh, that was really impressive, Ryan. So does that functionality within geodesign allow for optimization so that you don't have to a priori make a lot of these decisions? You can just have some objective function and then be agnostic to a lot of the decision making in that design process. Great question. So you could imagine design and scenario planning falling out on a spectrum. On one side of the spectrum, it could be model or analytically driven, i.e. to optimize certain variables. And on the other side of the spectrum, it could be more subjective. There could be actually be the insertion of, of, of art and perspective, you know, kind of communal knowledge being added. And what we found in the landscape design discipline, at least, is that it's probably someplace in the middle that you actually get your best design work. So geoplan is really effective in allowing us to pipe in the analytics to have that information contextually at our fingertips as the user expert as the stakeholders and the people of a particular location are engaged in the design process so this application allows for the two to be married uh, but it doesn't rely solely on optimization um, or um, or purely kind of subjective design it tries to meld those two worlds let me just add one thing yeah. that is in landscape design uh, there's multiple objective functions. So there is no optimum. There's only the idea of generating alternatives and evaluating the consequences of the different alternatives. So the economics, the environmental, the whatever, the fishing uh, are evaluation models. But how do you say, I want to have a single objective to drive it all? You could, but that's not going to satisfy all of your, your stakeholders. So the general logic in design is gaming or using right brain functions to lay out a bunch of alternatives and then evaluate them. And if you think about it long enough, you realize that, that that's the way the actual world works is people participate and look at the multiple objective functions and they come up with a sort of, a sort of best alternative that goes forward. And if you're really gonna have stakeholder involvement, it just requires that sort of thing. There's no single objective function modeling that can do it. Unless you just wanna go after fishing or just go after money or one single time. This, this web app technology has the ability to reach out and grab automated services like that of a geoprocessing model from a notebook or from a service, a geoprocessing service that could be hosted on ArcGIS Online or through Living Atlas, right? So it has the ability to reach out and integrate your sophisticated model, allow you to interplay with it in the application, and then, of course, display your, your results, right? So that's the the kind of the connection to the analytical side of things. As far as the design templates, that's all work that you would engage in configuration of, to use Jack's term, this generic app, right? So you saw our design template for these renewable energy technologies. Translate that to your oceans conservation design template. And it is, you know, this type of harvesting in this location, no boating in this location, coastal restoration here, right? That's the tapestry of design alternatives that you would build out then with corresponding metrics. And you interact with all of that within this application itself. Mm -hmm.